Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's only good morning for about eight more minutes, I see. Okay, all right. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 13, 44 through 50. Matthew 13, 44 through 50 for our sermon text. Follow along with me as I read the word of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Gracious God, give us the grace to zero in on this text. We pray that you would use it in our hearts in whatever way is needed. Salvation to those who do not know you as Savior and Lord. For those who do for us to submit afresh to you, to walk by faith today according to this text and what you reveal here, so that we may bear fruit as we walk by the Spirit that gives you praise. Not to us, O oh God, not to us, but to your name. Give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have heard it said, one man's trash is another man's treasure. It's not in the Bible, by the way. That's not something we find in the scriptures. <laughs> I guess you're wondering. One man may place great value on something that another man deems worthless. That's what we mean by saying one man's trash is another man's treasure. This morning I walked outside my door to get in my car and recognized that our neighbors across the street had a pool table out at the curb. And I thought, man, I know some people who could get some stuff done with that, you know. Uh, It's trash to them for whatever reason. Maybe it's a little broken. Maybe it doesn't fit in their house. Maybe they're they're going a different way with uh, decoration. Who knows? But there's been some great stuff that people have left out at the curb. we got some friends that continue to amaze me with what they find on the side of the road, right? One's One man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, there are some who would look at something very valuable and say, it's not valuable to me. There are other people who would look at something that is not of great value and they would place great value upon it. See, in these scenarios that I've uttered, what value you place on something matters regardless of its worth. But I want you to think about the kingdom of God. Think about the kingdom of God. It is intrinsically valuable. When it comes to something out on the curb, somebody might place value on it, other, another person might not place value on it, but when it comes to the kingdom of God, it is intrinsically valuable. It is priceless. It is infinite and worth regardless of whether or not you believe it to be true. But for you and for me, what value you place on the kingdom of heaven, what value you place on the kingdom of God matters greatly for this life and the one to come. In Matthew chapter 13, we have found it to be a chapter filled with parables and parables that zero in on the kingdom of God. Along the way, we have come to see this kingdom as now and not yet. I think you've heard us say that a number of times. The kingdom of God is now and not yet. It came with the arrival of the king of this kingdom, King Jesus, but we will not see the kingdom in its final consummated state until Christ returns. As sinners bow to the reign 
of King Jesus, then they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness, Paul calls it the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of God's beloved son. They are saved from God's judgment on the kingdom of darkness through the willing sacrifice of the king of the kingdom, Jesus Christ, who died in their place. And so we understand that, yes, the kingdom has come as more and more people bow the knee to King Jesus, but we await that final consummation when Christ returns. For those with ears to hear, these parables about the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13 reveal to us more about God's kingdom. They reveal that this kingdom calls for surrender. The kingdom of God calls for surrender. But it's a surrender with important qualities for us to discern. So I would give you four points this morning. The kingdom of God calls for perceptive surrender, for joyful surrender, for complete surrender and personal surrender. And so as we walk through these points, you need to ask yourself some questions. First of all, you may need to ask yourself, have I surrendered? Have I surrendered unto King Jesus and unto the kingdom of God? Ask yourself, am I bearing the fruit of this surrender? If so, and ask yourself, is surrender my lifestyle? Is surrender for me as one who claims to belong to the kingdom of God, is that characterize my life? As we ask those questions, we turn to our first point, perceptive surrender. Look with me at the text once again. There is a little bit of background imagery for us to understand. The second parable about the merchant is likely easier for us to understand, but the details of the first parable may be a bit strange to us. A guy just happens upon a treasure in a field. Really? That happens? But in that day, it was not unheard of. See, there were no banks in the first century to secure your wealth in. Think of uh, the parable of the talents the one servant who had the one talent. Now, he was uh, unfaithful. He, he brought no yield to his master, but he went and buried that talent in, in the earth, right? So there were no banks to secure wealth. And if a person was going to do some traveling, that person might take some of the valuable possessions that he owned and bury it in the dirt. But what if he didn't come back from that journey? Others, knowing that war was entering into the land and knew that looting soldiers would be um, just coming through houses and taking what they pleased, would often take their valuables and bear them, bury them in the sand, bury them in the dirt. But what if those people who did the burying didn't survive the war? This was commonplace enough so that it's not hard to imagine a person seeing part of a treasure sticking up out of the dirt while he is perhaps on a journey or doing some work in that field. Now, in the second of the two parables that we start out with here, the merchant is seeking pearls. And since they were a valuable commodity during that time, not only beautiful, but they were hard to acquire through diving. They didn't have any of the technology that we now have to acquire pearls. Because they were so valuable, this merchant was in the business of going to seek fine pearls. Now, for these first two parables, the first thing I want you to notice about each of these men is that they recognized the value of the object they discovered. They recognized the value of the object they discovered. They were perceptive to the worth of the treasure and the pearl. This was not just a bunch of junk covered over with dirt and the man knew it. This was not just any pearl and the merchant knew it. Why else would they have sold everything in order to own the treasure and the pearl if they didn't recognize the value of these treasures? When I was a kid, I collected baseball cards. Um, had a, I still have lots of baseball cards that really aren't worth much, but they sit in my closet nonetheless. When I was a kid, we and the other kids on the block would get together and trade our baseball cards You know, during the summer when we were looking for something to do. And one uh, day in particular, uh, I was trying to pull a fast one on a younger kid down the street. 
I had a baseball card by, it was just a, a no-name player that I don't even remember, but uh, this kid had a pretty good card. It was like a Ricky Henderson, if you know who I'm talking about, okay? And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trade this, make him think that this is a really great card so I can get the Ricky Henderson card. Well, see, that didn't really turn out the way I hoped it would because this boy's his older brother was there too. And his older brother knew the value of the Ricky Henderson card. And so I didn't get that card that day because there was someone who knew the value of it. There's someone who was there to say, no, don't do it. Don't make the trade. Now, if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God, then we've got to perceive its value. We've got to see it as incomparable, priceless, of infinite worth, or else we will not surrender ourselves to Jesus. If you don't see the worth, then you won't do the surrendering. Look with me at Matthew 16, a couple of pages to your right there. So we're thinking about per perceiving the value of God's kingdom. Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. And Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Do you perceive that to hang on to life as you desire it will mean the loss of your soul? But then on the other hand, to lose life as you desire it and let Christ define that life will mean the salvation of your soul for eternity. Do you recognize that? Do you perceive that gaining the whole world is not worth forfeiting your soul and life and the kingdom? Brothers and sisters, don't let the world tell you what is supremely valuable. Don't let your heart tell you what is supremely valuable. Don't let Satan and his whisperings tell you what is supremely valuable. Pray for eyes to see the infinite worth of God's kingdom. And do not think it strange to recognize the kingdom as priceless, though it means bowing to Jesus as king instead of bowing to yourself. That might be weird to you. That might sound off to you. You're saying that the kingdom of God is of infinite worth, yet that means that someone else will be telling me how to live my life. Someone else will be ruling over me and reigning over me. I don't like the sound of that because I want to call the shots. I want to direct my own steps. But listen, to live under the reign of Christ is the most awesome, the absolute best thing for your soul. He knows what your soul needs. You don't. I don't know what my soul needs. Christ does. And so we should surrender ourselves to him, to his lordship, to his reign and his rule in our lives, not holding back as we do so because it's worth it. I want you to look with me in another text. Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 28. Mark 10, 28. Listen to what Peter says to Jesus here. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. You might think that Peter is whining here. You might think that Jesus would respond by chiding him, rebuking him, but he doesn't. He lets him know about the promise. What you receive in the kingdom of God when 
you surrender yourself to Christ. Look at verse 29. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. He says, there's no contest. Look what you gain. The kingdom is worth it. Both now and in eternity, the kingdom is worth it and Jesus is worth it. If you haven't entered the kingdom of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, through surrendering to him, then I call you to do that today. But if you belong to that kingdom, we need to continue to have this mindset of surrender each day. I belong to Jesus. He is Lord of my life. He is worth whatever sacrifice I make today. Do you believe it? Do you trust him? The kingdom calls for perceptive surrender, but also joyful surrender. Look at me back at our text. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In his joy. Is this guy insane? Is he able to make decisions with a sound mind? Because people just don't do this kind of thing joyfully, do they? He's not crazy. Because his joy is tied to what we saw in point one. Because of the exceeding wealth of the treasure, losing everything to get it is a joyful prospect. Because of the, the value, because of the worth of the treasure. So you're saying, well, if I have to give this up in order to get this gain, of course I will. No contest. This is actually a pattern we see in the New Testament. Look with me at Hebrews 10. It's not the only place where we see this kind of joyful sacrificing for the kingdom of Christ. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 32. The author writes, Recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you, listen, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property Plundering of property, and there's joy in it? But there's a reason for this joy, and the author makes it clear. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Better and abiding. Why did these Christians accept this kind of abuse, this kind of suffering? It's because of what the reward is for those who surrender themselves unto King Jesus. I like what Piper says about this text here in chapter 10 of Hebrews. He says, what the world has to offer is both inferior and temporary when compared to life in the kingdom of God. Life in the kingdom of God is better and abiding. So that means what the world has to offer is inferior and temporary. But this is not the only place where we see this kind of attitude that we all ought to have. Look with me at Hebrews 11. Just flip over one page. We'll see that Moses had this kind of attitude as well. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Again, it doesn't make sense to the secular mind, to the worldly mind. But then we read verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. 
to the gain that he had not yet received, but knew he would in the future because of God's grace in Christ. And so he can forsake the riches of Egypt. And yes, even be mistreated along with the people of God because of the reward, because of the gain. Notice that the author says Moses chose something other than the pleasures of sin. He does not deny that sin is pleasurable. We wouldn't choose it if it wasn't pleasurable. If there wasn't some level of happiness that it gave us, we wouldn't choose it. He doesn't deny that sin is pleasurable, but this pleasure passes away. It's fleeting, and it does not compete with what's in store for us in God's kingdom. It's empty pleasure. Because of God's kingdom promises, we can accept loss with joy instead of despair, fear, or anger. Those who enter God's kingdom through Jesus Christ Surrender to him joyfully, knowing that it is the loss of life on my terms that leads to the gain of eternal life with Christ in God's kingdom. It is the loss of life on my terms that leads to the gain of eternal life with Jesus. In fact, you can't have the gain without the loss. Remember back in Matthew chapter 5? The Beatitudes, the very first Beatitude in Matthew 5, 3 is blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who say, I have nothing. Spiritually speaking, I have pockets out turned. All I have is grace, your grace. All I have is Christ. It's those who are poor in spirit and come crawling to the cross that's the person. Those are the people that have the kingdom of heaven. Think of the loss that a man must enter into when he wants to be committed to his fiance. When a man recognizes the beauty and worth of his fiance, that he will gladly give up whatever stands in the way of him committing himself to her. I remember hearing about a, a couple where uh, in order for um, the, the husband to marry his, his wife, he had to get rid of his cat. She was allergic to cats and he loved this cat, but you know what he said? Easily, gladly, we're going to find another home for this cat. Do I have to move? Do I have to move towns? Do I have to get a different job? I'll do it. Whatever it takes to be committed to you, to be in this relationship with you, because... He recognized the beauty and the worth of his fiance. It is the loss for us as we think about the kingdom of God. It is the loss that leads to the infinitely greater gain in Jesus. Paul knew this. He talks about it in Philippians chapter 3. Look with me there. Paul knew this. Philippians 3, 7 and 8 But whatever gain I had, and earlier talked about kind of his, his credentials, so to speak, as a Jew, that he could easily boast in only if the gospel weren't true. But he says these things, this, these credentials, this list of things, uh, that what I previously called gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because, listen, of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now, this is awesome. It's always surpassing, isn't it? It's always exceeding. It's always better, infinitely so. It is of surpassing worth to know Jesus Christ. Therefore, all of the gain that I thought I had, that's now lost to me. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Those things are not ultimate to me. Those things are not supreme to me. They are lost to me so that I will gain Christ. 
Paul counts everything as lost because knowing Christ is of surpassing worth. He counts all his former gains as rubbish in order that he may gain Christ. Until Christ is of ultimate worth to you, you will not gain him. Until he is of ultimate worth to you, you will not gain him. I love what Andrew Peterson says in one of his songs. He says it like this. He says, the blood of Jesus, when it's all you have, it's all you'll ever need. The blood of Jesus, when it's all that you have, it's all you'll ever need. You see that singular focus, that surrender of all things as ultimate except for Jesus Christ. Casting off all things as rubbish except for Jesus. He's talking about when it's all you have, it's all you'll ever need. When you perceive the pricelessness of Christ and his kingdom, then you will joyfully surrender that which is of limited value in order to enter that kingdom. Missionary David Livingston came back from years in Africa and people were making a big deal about all of the sacrifices that he had made for the Lord there. But he understood the value of the kingdom of God. He understood what it means to find our satisfaction in Christ. And he said, I never made a sacrifice. Now, does that mean that it wasn't hard for him there? No, oh, of course it was. There was much hardship in his missionary endeavors in Africa, but he says, I never made a sacrifice. And the reason why he says that is because he understands where the surpassing worth is. He understands where the gain is in the kingdom. And, and there's nothing that he's not willing to give up in order to serve this king that has brought him into that kingdom. See, for David Livingston, they were only sacrifices if Christ were not worth it. They were only sacrifices if Christ wasn't ultimate gain. But Christ is ultimate gain. Christ is worth it. So our surrender is a joyful surrender. Perceptive, joyful, and complete surrender. Number three, complete surrender. Look back with me at our text. Notice both men here. Verse 44 and verse 46. They sell all that they have to buy the field, to gain the pearl. They sell all that they owned. Let's be clear here. We don't buy our way into God's kingdom. That's not what is, is being described here in this, these parables. We don't buy our way into God's kingdom. There's never any earning for us because the wages of sin is death, right? If we're not saved by Christ's work, then we're not saved. Christ makes the payment for us. We, we pay nothing. So that's not what is being described. So what does Jesus mean by using the selling of possessions and monetary payment to describe what God's kingdom is like? It's just what we've been saying all along in this sermon. It, it's a picture of surrender. This selling all that they have to get the pearl, to get the treasure is a, is a picture of surrender. It's losing your life to find it in Christ. But as one pastor says, there is no halfway way to get the treasure or the pearl. There's no halfway way to get the treasure or the pearl. What does he mean? It means there is complete surrender, unconditional surrender. Think about two kingdoms. Let's say that you are entering into a new kingdom and you say to your king as you leave this kingdom behind and come to the new kingdom, you say to him, I will definitely be loyal to you most of the time. But, you know, I've got history with this other kingdom. I grew up there. It's very familiar to me there. It's very comfortable, okay? So I have to at least give some of my loyalty to that kingdom. But most of the time, I will be loyal to you and your kingdom. Doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. Why? Because when we're talking about the kingdom of God, 
Either Jesus is your king or he's not. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. We've talked about that a lot through this book of the Bible, through Matthew. Jesus is king or he's not. But if you're not serving King Jesus, if you haven't surrendered to King Jesus, then who are you serving? And is that idol worth your loyalty? God would say no, absolutely not. There's a picture in the book of Matthew of someone who didn't understand complete surrender. And so I want to show you in Matthew 19 who this man is. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. He's been called the rich young ruler. We read this. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Again, this is not about earning a place with Jesus. We can't do that. This text exposes the reality that the rich young ruler is not willing to completely surrender himself to follow Jesus. He, he wanted a version of eternal life that he defined, but he did not want Jesus. He did not want his rule and his reign, which means this, he did not truly perceive the worth of Christ. He did not see the immense value of the kingdom of God. So he was refusing to surrender, refusing to give up what was in his heart as his supreme value, that which is temporary and fleeting. The application here is not that everyone should sell all their possessions for Jesus this week, but it is a call to see Jesus as Lord over all that we have. It's a call to see Jesus as Lord over our entire lives, in fact. It is to see nothing else as so valuable that you could not part with it for the sake of Christ. This kind of thinking doesn't make sense to the world because self is the idol we're supposed to surrender to in the world. The highest rule and reign belongs to the self in our culture and our society. And we're supposed to do all we can to get what we want, what satisfies us, what fulfills us. So when we talk about surrendering to another, why would you do that? Why would you see these things that you love as expendable for the sake of someone else? Are we, are we afraid of the world thinking we're crazy fools for Jesus? I think we are sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves. We don't want to be thought of as fanatics. Really? It's all about Jesus? Every, every nook and cranny of your life? Every square inch? It's about Jesus? Yes, it is. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is the one who holds all things together. Of course he is. Often our Christianity, I think, is, is too tame, brothers and sisters. Often our, create, our, our Christianity is too reserved. We're holding too much back. I think if we're honest, we can say it like this. If we can look at the scriptures and say, okay, yes, this is what we see. This is the message, the thread I see in the word of God. It's this. There's a problem if the world doesn't think we're strange. There's a problem if they don't kind of cock their heads like this whenever they get to know us and say, okay, all right. Do, do they think we're just like them? 
Because self is the supreme, ultimate desire in the world. But for us, it's Christ. So there must be a difference. There must be a completely different direction of life. The way you spend your time, your money, what relationships you pour into, how much attention you give to that really, really old book called the Bible, your willingness to keep forgiving repeatedly, your insistence on showing love in the face of ridicule, the frequency with which you talk about Jesus. There ought to be a strangeness about us to the world. What is there in your life that is too valuable for you to part with for the sake of Jesus Christ? It's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Are there things that are too precious to us, too valuable to us, and we can't imagine living life without it, even if Christ were to take it from us or call us to lay it down? What is it in your life Pray that the Lord would search you and know you and show that to you so that you could walk in his way everlasting. Think of Jesus. Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, Paul says in Philippians 2. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant so he could die in our place. He let go of his heavenly privileges to come down and take on humanity for us. So what is it that you consider a thing to be grasped that you're not willing, willing to loosen your grip on? What is it that you're saying, I must continue to have this. I won't keep it in an open hand. I won't yield it to Christ. What is it that you're grasping because Jesus Christ, he wasn't willing to not give up those heavenly privileges so that he could come and be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that we would have access to his kingdom and his forever family. This is a, not only a perceptive surrender. It's not only a joyful surrender, a complete surrender, but it's also a personal surrender. It must be a personal surrender. For each of us, every soul in God's kingdom has surrendered to Christ in faith by God's grace. If you will enter the kingdom of God, then you must surrender to Christ. You cannot ride in on another's personal surrender. So what's it going to be? Have you surrendered? If not, will you surrender? When will you surrender? No one else can surrender for you. I, I leave you with this from 1 Kings 18 as Elijah is there. He's talking to Israel. And Israel is there with the prophets of Baal. And there's, they're going to have this contest. There's going to be an altar here. The prophets of Baal are going to call upon Baal to come and show himself at this altar. Elijah is going to pray and call upon God to come and show himself at the altar that he has made on Mount Carmel. And so this is what he says before God comes and reveals that he is the only God. This is what Elijah says to Israel. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And as Yahweh shows up and consumes the altar with fire, licking up every drop of water in the trench that Elijah had dug around that altar, he shows himself to be the one God. And so the question is, are you going to follow him? Are you going to surrender to him? Remember the gain, the value. Christ is your only hope. Do not go on limping between two different opinions. There is only one that is right. As Matthew Henry says, in an old Puritan English style, do not settle for goodly pearls. What does he mean? 
It's an old way of saying don't settle for lesser pearls. The things of this world that are fleeting, that are empty, that are shallow, don't settle for them. They're of limited value, but the pearl of great price is eternally valuable. Don't settle because settling threatens your eternity and your life now too. We see how crucial this is in the final few verses of our text. The parable of the net is very similar to the parable of the weeds. And so we read this in 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't go on limping between two opinions because there's only one that's right. And at the end of the age, there will no longer be opportunity to surrender. You see the urgency of what he's saying. Why are we waiting? There is today. We don't know if there's tomorrow, but there is today. So come before there's that final separation. Remember this. The kingdom is worth it, and Christ is worth it. If we're thinking back to that baseball card illustration, if, if that young boy down the street had a Babe Ruth rookie card, I would not have hesitated to say, take all of my cards if I can have that one. How much more so when it comes to the kingdom of God, the eternal joy of surrendering to King Jesus and not having that be limited, not having that be temporary, but infinite in its depth and worth. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for this text. Make us to see the worth of Christ and his kingdom. Thank you that Jesus Christ died and rose again and paid the penalty for sin for all who believe. Lead those who have not bowed the knee to do that today. For those of us who belong to your kingdom today, may we afresh confess that Jesus is Lord. And may there be no disconnect between what we say and what we do and how we live. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen.